On a stormy night in New Jersey, police guard the road outside the city, searching for a criminal. They stop a speeding truck, and an officer asks the driver for ID, but he doesn't have one. Other officers check the truck's back and are shocked to find a large group of dogs. Moments later, psychiatrist Evelyn arrives at the police station to evaluate the driver, deciding between jail time or a mental institution. She finds the driver in a wheelchair with a fresh wound. The driver, a drag queen named Doug, explains the dogs are his children. Doug shares his story. He grew up in a religious, abusive family where his father Mike raised dogs for fighting and often starved them to make them more aggressive. Mike was abusive to Doug and his mother, but favored his older son, Richie. Despite the aggression of the dogs during fights, they loved Doug, who would secretly care for them. One day, Richie caught Doug feeding the dogs and told Mike, who punished Doug by throwing him into the dog's cage. The dogs comforted Doug, and he ended up living in the cage, even through winter, surviving on scraps. Doug's mother eventually brought him cans to hide and told him she was running away because she was pregnant and wanted a better life for her baby. Doug tells Evelyn he doesn't resent his mother for leaving. Later, Richie put up a sign on Doug's cage that said, in the name of God, blaming Doug for their mom leaving. However, Doug smiled because he saw the sign backward, reading God as dog. After Evelyn leaves, a flashback shows what happened before Doug's arrest. A man named Juan entered an abandoned college building and found a Doberman guarding the corridor. He asked for the dog man, and a door opened to Doug's secret quarters, which were surprisingly nice. Juan had installed cameras a few months ago, and now brought Doug a puppy found by Martha, an old lady who ran the local laundromat and did Doug's laundry. Juan explained that a gangster known as the Executioner was extorting local businesses, and Martha had to sell family belongings to pay him. Doug assured Juan that he would handle it. Doug disguised himself as a widow and waited near a club frequented by gangsters. He sent a small dog inside with a phone, which it delivered to the executioner just before it rang. The gangster answered, and a larger dog entered, clamping its mouth on his groin. Doug warned him not to move, or the dog would cause permanent damage. Doug demanded that the executioner leave Martha alone, threatening that the dog would enjoy a meal of nuts if he refused. The executioner agreed, but sent his men after the dogs as soon as they left the bar. In the present, Evelyn visits Doug's home, where the police are collecting evidence amid bodies, blood, and bullet holes. She picks up a few items and returns to the station, where Doug, now cleaned up, thanks her for bringing his things and continues his story. Little Doug had lived in the cage for months, getting his education from magazines hidden behind a plank, likely left by his mother. One day, one of the dogs got pregnant, so Doug hid the puppies from his family. Unfortunately, Richie saw him and told their dad, Mike. Mike, armed, came to take care of the puppies. Doug latched onto the cage door, yelling at Mike while the dogs barked. Furious, Mike shot Doug through the door, hitting his hand and making him lose a finger. The bullet ricocheted and hit Doug's spine. Richie, fearing for Doug's life, took Mike inside after dropping a handkerchief for Doug. Unable to move much, Doug wrapped his bleeding hand with the handkerchief and put his finger in a bag. He showed a picture of a police car to his dog and gave it the bag, telling the dog to find the cops. The dog ran across town, found a police car, and got the officer's attention. Soon, officers surrounded Doug's house, stormed in, and found Doug in the cage and Richie clinging to Mike in fear. An ambulance took Doug away, but the doctor didn't remove the bullet. In the present, Doug tells Evelyn that he can walk a bit with leg braces and stand for a few seconds, but removing the bullet could leave him completely paralyzed, which is a risk every time he stands up. Mike got a 20-year sentence but died by suicide after two weeks. Richie received 12 years and was released after eight for good behavior. When Richie was released, dogs followed him from the prison, and as more joined, they eventually mauled him to death in an alley. After Doug was released from the hospital, he was sent to an orphanage but struggled to make friends. He spent his time in the library reading. The only person who befriended him was Salma, a young woman who helped at the orphanage and loved Shakespeare. 
She introduced Doug to her favorite books, and encouraged him to perform small plays for the other kids, using simple props but putting a lot of heart into their acting, which the children loved. Doug enjoyed dressing up and loved Salma, teaching him how to put on makeup, saying it helped him be whoever he wanted to be. Salma was bright, creative, and unique, making Doug quickly fall in love with her. Unfortunately, she left the orphanage to pursue an acting career. Doug collected every article about her plays in a scrapbook. As an adult, Doug earned a bachelor's degree in biological sciences through online courses and got a job at a dog shelter. When Salma made it to Broadway, Doug attended her play and went backstage. Salma recognized him immediately and appreciated his flowers. She was thrilled when he gave her the scrapbook. Doug's hopes rose, but he was devastated to learn Salma was married to the director and expecting a baby. Heartbroken, Doug congratulated them and returned to the shelter, where he stood up to yell and hit the cages in fury. The dogs barked, and one managed to open the cage, allowing all the dogs to come out and comfort Doug. Afterward, Doug cut his hair to symbolize letting go. Later, two government men informed him that the shelter was closing due to budget cuts. Doug argued that he had kept the shelter running on donations despite annual budget cuts, and the only municipal support was the building itself. The men admitted the site was being sold to a developer for profit. Doug had until Monday to move out, and the dogs would hopefully be sent to other shelters. On Monday, authorities found the building empty. Doug had run away with the dogs. Doug moved into an abandoned college building and read to his doggy family. He struggled to find a job due to his wheelchair. One afternoon, Doug went to a club looking for a barman job and arrived during a drag queen's rehearsal. He loved their costumes and art. The owner told Doug the bar job was taken, but Doug expressed his desire to perform. The owner doubted people would be interested in a wheelchair performance, so Doug stood up and explained he could stand for a whole song. Impressed, the queens convinced the owner to give Doug a chance. The following Friday, the queens helped Douglas get clothes, makeup, and a wig for his performance. To make a good impression, he removed his light braces and asked his new friends to be ready to catch him afterward. They helped him reach the stage, and he waited behind the curtains, which opened as he was introduced as Edith Piaf. Doug sang in French with slight hand movements, enchanting the audience and his co-workers with his voice and raw emotion. The crowd clapped and cheered, wanting more. The curtains closed and the other queens caught Doug just before he fell. From then on, Doug performed at the club every Friday night. This didn't pay enough to live on, so Doug started a service matching lonely people with dogs for company and protection, sometimes involving illegal activities like with the executioner. One day while cooking, Doug's dogs brought him ingredients from the pantry, inspiring him to use them for what he called fair redistribution of wealth. His smallest dog would sneak into rich people's houses through unlocked windows or ceiling hatches, then open a bigger entrance for the other dogs. Together, they stole jewelry without anyone suspecting animals were responsible. Things went well until a rich lady, suspecting insurance fraud, called Agent Ackerman. Every window and door in her house had been locked except a tiny bathroom window, and her dogs didn't bark. She gave Ackerman the security camera tapes, and he saw a dog running out with something in its mouth. Remembering other mysterious cases, he reviewed more recordings and was shocked to find the same dogs always on screen, previously dismissed as strays. In one recording, Ackerman saw a man pretending to be a guard waiting for the dogs with a truck. Investigating the license plate, he found Doug's profile and learned he worked at the club. One Friday, Ackerman attended Doug's performance and noticed he was wearing a stolen necklace. After the show, Ackerman pretended to be a fan and asked Doug out for dinner, but Doug declined, saying he had to feed his kids. Ackerman followed Doug home and entered the old building with a gun. The dogs warned Doug, who hid them. Ackerman found the Doberman guarding the corridor and considered shooting, but Doug offered the jewelry in the safe. While Ackerman checked the box, Doug ordered his dogs to kill him. With most of his story covered, Doug explains why he got arrested. The evening after Doug helped Martha, the executioner and his gang found the abandoned building by beating up Juan until he talked. They killed Juan, alerting Doug, who told the dogs to prepare for war while he grabbed a weapon. 
The executioner ignored the Doberman and shot at the metal door, but Doug escaped through a hidden corridor. A small dog ran through the corridor, leading a gangster into a hole where bigger dogs killed him. The gang split up to follow the dogs peeking into the corridor. One man followed a dog into a bathroom with a wet floor where the dog electrocuted him with a released cable. Another followed a chihuahua into a locker room where Doug shot him through the wall. A man entered the wrong room and was mauled by huge dogs. Another gangster fell into a hidden pit and when his friend tried to help, the dog pushed him in two. Doug then shot them both. In the corridor, a gangster stepped on a trap and was left hanging for a dog to catch. Another gangster also fell into a trap and was mauled. The executioner, growing nervous, asked for a better weapon. Doug opened fire through the wall, killing several men. When the executioner shot back, a bullet hit Doug's back before he ducked. Desperate, Doug dragged himself through a narrow corridor back to his quarters. The executioner used a bigger weapon to break down the door, but ran out of bullets when he tried to shoot Doug. The dogs then killed him. Doug and his dogs escaped in a truck, but the police caught them. While waiting in the police car, Doug signaled the dogs, and they ran away. In the present, Evelyn tells Doug she's heard enough and leaves. Doug smokes near the window, smiling when he hears a dog howl, signaling all the other dogs to gather. While Doug dresses up with Evelyn's things, the dogs enter the station, scare the front guard into passing out, and a slim dog steals the keys, dropping them by Doug's door. Doug escapes, leaving his chair behind, and walks to the church across the street. He asks God for judgment and then takes his last breath, surrounded by his dogs and every dog in town. Meanwhile, the Doberman goes to Evelyn's house to protect her from her violent ex-husband. If you enjoyed this video, don't be shy to hit the like button, and if you disliked it, hit the dislike button twice, just to be sure. It would be best if you watched the whole movie. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe for more videos like this.